will now come to order. Can the clerk call the roll, please? Uh, I'll call the roll. So first we have Daisy Castro. Present. Thank you, Caitlin Tran. She said she's absent. Jonathan Bruns. Here. Thank you, Lenka Wright. Here. BJ Fatum. Here. Sylvia Alvarez. I don't see her here. Freddie Sidbury. He's here. Freddie is here. Thank you. Andrew Ditlevson. Here. Thank you. Ramon Martinez. Here. Thank you. Anadina Cardenas. Here. Thank you. And Teresa is here as well. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Megan. Is there a motion to approve the orders of the day? Can we get a motion to approve? I would move. Thank you, BJ. Like, yes, like I that? will second. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all in favor? How about oh, just... I'll call the roll one more time, please. Thank you. First, we have Daisy Castro. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to call first names now. Caitlin is absent. Jonathan? Aye. Uh. Lenka? Aye. BJ? Aye. Sylvia? I believe she's absent. Um, Freddie? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Ramon? I'm sorry, Ramon? Thank you. And Adina? Aye. Thank you. That motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. So there's no public record. Uh, so we will move on to item three, which is the consent calendar. Would anyone like to pull the item for discussion? If not, we will move forward. Uh, all those in, uh, is there a, a speaker card? Uh, is there anyone wishing to speak on this item, Megan? Um, Tony, do we call? Public comment on this item? Yes, public comment on all items. Blair Beekman. Thank you, Tony. All right, thank you. I think this has, uh, this is about the minutes process. If it, it has the previous minutes on it. Uh, That's right. Oh, very much of a thank you that you're allowing a public comment today on it. Um, you know, I was, I was impressed. I have been impressed with how you cells have been handling uh, this process and you're slowly learning how to, uh, you know, uh, learn previous steps. And I learned from the, the past meeting that, you know, we may not be, they were in 1985 or so, they were answering and asking basic fundamental questions of how city government can work. And we're asking a bit more refined questions at this time, I feel, and we're refining it a bit. And, um, but nonetheless, to have to be able to ask those fundamental questions is, is the basis of how we build the future of a community and good democratic practices and, and want to work towards, you know, previous good efforts of community and city council ideas. And thank you that you are really addressing those and those seem important uh, components and um, um, important part of this entire process and mayor ideas, strong mayor ideas maybe taking a bit of a back seat at this time and thank you and how you're presenting that uh, to ourselves as a public i feel it's a really important <laughs> function thank you thank you are there any other members of the public who would like to speak <clears throat> on this item staff i will assume no, sorry yeah. i was muted no there is not <laughs> thank you so much tony okay is there a motion to approve the consent calendar Sure. I will, I will. Jonathan, I saw you first and then Ramon. Okay, all in favor? Say aye, please. I'll, I'll take the roll again, uh, please. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I keep my forgetting. Mistake on the script. I didn't change that on the script. Sorry. Okay, sorry. One last time, guys. Um, I'll start with Daisy. Aye. Thank you. Jonathan? Uh. That was aye. 
Thank yeah. You. Thank you. And BJ? Yes. Freddie? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Ramon? Aye. And Adina? Aye. And that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. All right, let's move on to the reports, which are informational items only. I do not have a, a report today. Clerk, do you have a report? Oh, yes. I was like, I know there was something I needed to report. So uh, we have live transcripts of this meeting. So if you or a member of the public wants to see on Zoom closed captioning or transcript, you go to the bottom of your screen and you click live transcript. Um, so I've I, that's enabled. It's approximately 80% accurate. Um, and it's kind of exciting because you can also view the full transcript. So if you step away to use the bathroom and you want to see what was said while you were gone, you can click view full transcript and kind of scroll backwards and see what was said. Um, so that'll be enabled at all future meetings. So we'll have closed captioning on YouTube and we'll have transcripts via Zoom. Great. Thank you, Tony. And um, I know we have a, a placeholder here for the consultant, but I believe we'll be hearing from the consultant in just a moment. So uh, if there's no objection by our consultant, we'll move on. <clears throat> there is no public hearing tonight. So we will move on to new business item six, which is uh, the first item is, and our only item is the redistricting process, a workshop. And I'll ask our city clerk to introduce our consultants in the process. Tonight we have Paul Mitchell, who's with Redistricting Partners. Um, I think you guys were very lucky to get Redistricting Partners as your redistricting consultant. They're one of the, the top um, companies out there that help different agencies with redistricting. And so Paul is here to give you his, I think, 102, Redistricting 102. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna bring up the PowerPoint slide and if somebody can just give me a thumbs up that uh, you can see that. Yes, Alrighty. you can. Yes. I see it. Okay, thanks. And I should have amended this to change it to say 102, but I'm not that quick. Um, but this is an overview of the redistricting process and some of it might be things that you've already heard. I know you had a great presentation from Common Cause um, but as I've learned, especially with the redistricting commissions that we've been working with, um, hearing some of these elements over and over and maybe from different contexts um, is very helpful in kind of developing the dexterity that you're going to need to deal with these uh, concepts as you go through the process. So um, the things I'm going to be going over, um, what is redistricting, touching on the federal, state and federal voting rights act, what gerrymandering is, what the traditional redistricting principles are, uh, some census data information, uh, talk about public input, and then go through really kind of where the rubber meets the roads, the, the methods for line drawing that are used by uh, agencies and commissions in ultimately getting to a final plan and completing your work. So what is redistricting? Um, redistricting at the core of it is the balancing of populations and we, uh, do this after every census in order to achieve a couple different things uh, to create equitable uh, relationships between government and the public that it's serving. The first is the idea of equal representation. Now for that, we're thinking, um, how can somebody's voice be equal, whether they're on one side of town or the other, when say they have a pothole or they have an issue with um, a safety concern or they have an issue with their, their city government. Um, if you have districts that are balanced and having the same number of people, then that starts to create a more level playing field. Um, in one of the extreme examples that I like to use, uh, we did a redistricting once for an agency that hadn't redrawn their lines since 1950. And in that instance, there was one district that had 12,000 people in it and one district that had 100,000 people in it. So in that case, if somebody had a pothole and they were living in the 12,000 person district, they could probably get pretty prompt attention from their elected representative. Um, but in the 100,000 person district, you would need eight people to have the same 
quantity of voice with their elected official to uh, meet the same problem. So that lack of equal representation is from the 14th Amendment, and it's a requirement that in doing redistricting, we balance that. The second is the idea of one person, one vote. And that's the ability to elect a candidate. In that same example, um, you might not have all 12,000 being eligible voters or 100,000, but maybe you have 70,000 in the big district and you know 10,000 in the small district. In that instance, you still have a seven to one inequity in the voting power uh, that each of those individuals have. So in the big district, you would have to have seven, you and six of your friends uh, voting for the candidate to have the same voice as uh, one individual person in the district with 10,000 voters. So we're going to try and balance these things uh, through the process of redrawing boundaries. So redistricting law has been changing uh, considerably. It seems like it's constantly being, uh, you know, facing different changes through different processes. Um, one is in federal law, we've had uh, a number of things happen nationally that have a big impact on how lines will be drawn around the country, both at the state level and in local government. One is elimination of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. In California, not the whole state, but just some counties were covered by the Federal Voting Rights Act, uh, Section 5. Um, and its elimination won't affect Santa Clara County or agencies in Santa Clara County, but it will affect some counties in the Central Valley and north of you up in Yuba County. Um, Supreme Court decisions have also had an impact. Uh, when we talked in the previous slide about those ideas of equal representation and one person, one vote, there's always been this question about, are we drawing districts primarily to deal with that equal representation or primarily to deal with voting? And in a case in Texas, uh, having to do with state Senate districts, they were trying to draw districts kind of looking more at the voter side, looking at can we draw districts to balance them based on equal number of registered voters or eligible voters using other data sets. And the Supreme Court came down and said no and reinforced the idea that when we talk about districts being equal, we talk about them based on total people, not voters. Um, and then HR1 is also a federal attempt to try to create uh, protections for voters in a number of different areas. The redistricting element would be uh, portions of the law that would impose a California style statewide redistricting around the country. Um, but that and other things, even potentially the federal level reimposing portions of section five would have impacts on redistricting. So we still have kind of a fluid state at the federal level. Uh, another Supreme Court decision, by the way, has to do with uh, their decision recently saying that they cannot adjudicate uh, partisan redistricting uh, and partisan gerrymandering. So we won't uh, have that necessarily impact our redistricting here, but that's just to say that there's still a lot of activity at the federal court level. In California, and both at the California statewide level and in municipalities, we also see a lot of activity regarding redistricting. The big one that will impact what we do here is the Fair Maps Act. That law um, recently enacted will affect all cities and counties with a number of different process and criteria considerations that you'll have to use in your redistricting. And you'll have to use those in concert with any local uh, ordinances that you have. Um, Prop 11 and 20, the statewide redistricting, won't affect us in our city redistricting, but it's an example of the state significantly changing the way that uh, redistricting happens. And Prop 11 and 20 really did help set some new norms that will trickle down into local redistricting as well. Another way in which redistricting has really been transformed is the perceptions by the public about redistricting. In a recent survey, a whopping 97% of voters said that local government should be required to have open, transparent redistricting. And in addition to voter sentiment, the media and their focus uh, on redistricting, and in, in part, simply their ability to do better reporting on what's happening in the districting process is really transforming the landscape for all agencies that are doing redistricting and, and uh, 
really elevating the expectations for what's going to happen throughout the process. In the State and Federal Voting Rights Act, uh, there are, like I said, the Federal Voting Rights Act. I mentioned Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act that has been basically put on hold. It's now inactive. But Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act is alive and well. And it's an important element of the federal protections for protected classes in ensuring that districts are not drawn to weaken the voting power of those communities, particularly in areas where they have enough cohesiveness and enough density to make more than 50% of any individual district. And we can talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. The California Voting Rights Act comes up a lot because it sounds like it should affect what we're doing. It's the Voting Rights Act and it says California in the name, but the California Voting Rights Act won't actually impact what we do in our districting process because it is solely focused on at-large agencies, agencies where one election you vote for three people and the next election you vote for two people or something like that. Um, and the conversion of those agencies to districted elections. And in your county, you have examples of many agencies that have had to convert under the California Voting Rights Act. Uh, but while people might mention it, it actually is an operative in the redistricting for agencies that are already California Voting Rights Act compliant, like San Jose. Now, when we get to the Federal Voting Rights Act um, and any questions regarding it, we will be looking to your, um, your legal counsel to really help define what is required. Um, and that might get into a lot of additional uh, work for your legal counsel to really kind of dig into those, uh, into all the conditions that apply to the Federal Voting Rights Act. But I'll give you my kind of from the redistricting professional uh, uh, description of, of what it requires. So first off, like I mentioned earlier, a minority group that is sufficiently large and dense enough, densely enough populated in an area to comprise 50% of a potential district is one of the initial requirements. Um, in addition to that, it's not just that they exist, but it's that they're also politically cohesive. And in this sense, what that means is that they uh, do what is kind of in layperson terms, uh, block vote, meaning that they vote in a, in, a, in a consistent pattern, whether it's for candidates or for ballot measures or other issues. And that that community suffers from a contrasting block voting against their issues by the majority traditionally white population. So you need to have both sides of that in order to have that block voting. It has to be two-sided. Um, and the determination of whether or not they qualify um, under section two is really something where we want to look at your legal counsel and your legal counsel might rely upon analysis from a demographer like me, but a separate one uh, that would do a racially polarized voting analysis to really dig into whether or not that population block votes and the ability for that block voting to allow for them to have a quote unquote effective majority minority district. This becomes an issue as an example uh, in some of the statewide redistricting in 2011. They would say, okay, we can create a 50 or 50.01% 50 Latino district in this portion of LA. And the legal council, uh, maybe groups like MALDEF and other uh, social justice groups would come forward and say, look, we understand that that's technically majority minority, but in order for that majority minority district to be effective, we believe given their lower rates of registration, uh, disenfranchisement or other factors uh, that it needs to be 55% citizen voting age population or some other metric. So when we talk about majority minority down the road, we might talk about it needing to be a little bit higher than that strict 50% number. There's also possibilities in some circumstances and you might hear people talk about a coalition majority minority district. We don't actually see a lot of these in California, but the idea of a coalition majority minority district is if some population cannot reach that 50% as its own ethnic population, but there are other ethnic populations that are also protected classes that when combined 
given their combined cohesive voting patterns, that they can be determined to be an effective voting bloc. Um, again, it's not something that uh, we see in California traditionally. It's also something that hasn't been as fully adjudicated as a traditional majority minority district, but it is something that you might see come up in the process. Now, a lot of times uh, we'll see districts drawn where there are ethnic populations that don't reach that 50%. Um, and in a lay person term, they might say, oh, that's a seat that traditionally elects Latino candidates or traditionally elects African-American candidates. It's important to know that when we're drawing districts, if we don't have your attorney saying that's a section two district, you cannot draw the districts with race being a primary factor. So you can't draw districts and have it be predominantly factor of ethnicity. You can draw districts based on you know, historic communities, language, access to facilities, shared uh, educational income, other factors, but you would be uh, prohibited essentially and your lawyers would try to kind of tamp down any discussion of drawing a district based predominantly on race unless the determination has been made that that is a district that would qualify under section two of the Voting Rights Act. And again, Paul, yeah. No, excuse me. Uh, before you move on, I just wanted to ask, would you like commissioners to ask you questions during your presentation or wait to the end? Uh, that would be the chair's prerogative. I'm happy with whatever. Okay, so if there is a commissioner that has a question on any of these slides, uh, please let me know, maybe raise your hand, please. Thank you. And if they want to wait till the end, I can always uh, bring the slide presentation back up. When I'm done, I usually close the slide presentation so we can see each other better. But if somebody says, can you bring up a slide, I can probably do that. Thank you. So when I tell people I do redistricting, oftentimes the first word that comes out of their mouth is gerrymandering, because that's what most people think about when they think about redistricting. And that comes oftentimes from this picture that people remember from their high school textbook of the first gerrymander. It was a political cartoon, Governor Gary. Um, so technically some redistricting nerds will call it a gerrymander. Um, but it was state Senate districts that were drawn in a way to protect political power and had this snaking, you know, district that went from one end of the state to the other. Um, and that's what, where this political cartoon came from. So uh, that's kind of an old timey thing. It's 208 years old, uh, to be specific. Uh, but it's not that gerrymanders don't happen anymore. Um, in fact, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a state Senate district um, that my friend was elected in. And uh, it has, to me, a lot of the same look as the original gerrymander. Um, it's got a little bit of wings and talons and a head. Um, but it, so it, to me, it's an example, um, a little funny one about uh, the existence of gerrymandering in current district line drawing. Now, that is the whole concept that you learn when you first learn about redistricting in the process. Uh, if you do uh, more studying, you might find people coming up with something like this, which is a little thought piece experiment where um, you have, uh, in this example, five yellow triangles and four green ones. And if I gave most people 10 seconds and said, draw three districts, they would draw something like that horizontal bars or vertical bars, something kind of sensible. And in an instance like this, what they've done is they've created what is essentially a proportional uh, districting plan, meaning that uh, the yellow will be able to elect representatives roughly in the proportion to their share of the agency as a whole. Um, in this instance, they are the majority, they would be able to elect generally two candidates of their choice in in this three district scenario. But somebody who wanted to potentially gerrymander the district could draw this and magically now the green is able to elect candidates of their choice in a manner that is not proportional to their share of the population. And oftentimes if you see this, you'll see these as red and, and blue dots to, to represent political parties. When we talk about municipal redistricting, I purposefully don't use the partisan construct because oftentimes in municipal redistricting, it really isn't about political party, it's about other things. So 
Um, when we talk about redistricting and gerrymandering, I think it's important to get beyond this first example of gerrymandering that most people think of, which is the partisan gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering exists. Um, it's obviously uh, extremely prob problematic uh, around the country. And you do see a lot of instances where states have that proportional representation of their political party not being represented in the proportional uh, members of, of state legislatures or Congress elected from those states. So it's clearly a problem, but it's also something that the courts have said is not something that they can uh, enforce. They've decided essentially at the Supreme Court level, at least for right now, to say, we take a pass on partisan gerrymandering. Fortunately, as I've mentioned earlier, a lot of states have stepped up uh, and localities have stepped up to try to enforce their own state laws. And there can still be state lawsuits on partisan gerrymandering, just not federal. Racial gerrymandering is an area where the courts are willing to step in and they've repeatedly found racial gerrymandering to be unlawful and they've accepted certain methodologies for identifying and kind of pulling out what is a racial gerrymander. There's obviously, if you read up on this, some concern in this redistricting cycle that uh, agencies will continue to do racial gerrymanders and then just call it a partisan gerrymander. They'll say, well, that racial group Sure, they're all shoved in one district in a way that disenfranchises them, but we were just trying to draw Democrats together. Um, so there is concern that racial gerrymandering will still be done under the guise of the more permissible partisan gerrymandering, uh, but we'll see how that carries out through uh, this re the rest of this redistricting cycle. Incumbent gerrymandering is another way that we see uh, districts being drawn in a way that it, it essentially violates the, the concept that districts are drawn to meet those other two main criteria about equal representation, one person, one vote, when districts are drawn primarily to preserve the cores of uh, areas represented by incumbents or to draw a district where a district is drawn and then like a little lip of the district is pushed out to take in the house of a incumbent or candidate. When we talk about Traditional redistricting principles, a lot of these are built to try to uh, eliminate the opportunity for those types of gerrymandering. And I'll talk first about the traditional criteria, and then I can get into specifics of, of what rules we have here in California and you have locally. So the traditional criteria start with that first thing that I've talked about a couple of times already, which is that districts are equal size. And when we do that, we talk about people, not citizens or voters or something else. And it's pretty easy to see kind of equal size uh, when you're looking at this utilizing the census data. And it's important to note that equal size does not mean perfectly equal. equal. It means within a certain deviation. A, a deviation is a measure in redistricting where you say the ideal district size is 10,000. And if one district is 10,100, it is deviating from that norm by 100. Uh, when we look at redistricting around the country, you'll see Congress, traditionally Congress now, based on uh, interpretations of Supreme Court cases, congressional districts now are drawn to a one person deviation. So statewide in the last California redistricting, each congressional district, uh, the equal size was 702,905. So you'll see districts that range from 702,904 to 702,906. So uh, it's a one person deviation. In local government, the deviation allowed is 10%. Now, that 10% deviation sometimes is interpreted to be one district is, can be more than 5% below the ideal, and another district can't be 5% above the ideal. But in reality, it means that the total deviation from the smallest district to the largest district is no more than 10%. You could theoretically have a district that's 9% above if all the other districts are 1% below, if you understand. So that deviation is important to discuss because um, 
it is the latitude you're given. And as we go through this, we'll discuss how much of that latitude you want to give yourselves. Other agencies like the state legislature or others will oftentimes use another deviation that they either are required to follow or that they like by a statute or an ordinance or that they just choose to follow as a part of their setting up their own internal criteria. It's important to note that this equality is required. However, being overly dogmatic about that equality and trying to maybe ad adhere to a more strict deviation, a smaller deviation, isn't always better. Um, so I always encourage agencies to start with the idea that they have the full breadth of this 10% deviation in order to kind of start the process of drawing their lines. And here's the reason why. As we get through all the multiple criteria you're gonna have to follow, you're gonna want to do things like preserve neighborhood boundaries, to protect the Federal Voting Rights Act, to ensure communities of interest can be effective in elected candidates of choice in districts by being kept you know, as densely as possible into individual seats. And if down the, if at the beginning of your redistricting process, you say, aha, we want to do a 1% deviation because that sounds like it's really, you know, strict and something we want to hold to. And then down the road, you find that that 1% deviation decision made it harder for you to protect a community of interest or harder for you to protect a neighborhood or impossible for you to protect a federal voting rights act or create a section two district, then in a way you've boxed yourself into a corner um, before you know the full implications. So what we generally recommend is uh, to start with that idea of having the full ability, that full range of your 10% deviation. And then as we get into final plans, if there are two plans that are equally perfect for what you wanna do, and one has a lower deviation, then sure, you can take the one that has lower deviation and you can use your confidence that that creates more equal representation for those residents, but make that decision maybe after you've seen the potential implications of, of how that impacts the other criteria that you wanna preserve. Drawing districts that are contiguous, this is something that in one sense seems really easy, but then in another sense has its own little elements to think about too. So contiguous just means that they're one part. So this little graphic here is a, an example of something that is not contiguous, but it also should be thought about in terms of how a district functions, not just in terms of it's literal, like from a satellite photo being contiguous. So, one way of thinking about this is to look to the north of you and think about Treasure Island. It's not literally contiguous to the city of San Francisco, but if we were drawing a congressional district, we would probably draw it being attached to San Francisco, not attached to, you know, Marin. Um, and that's because it's more functionally contiguous to the city of San Francisco. Same thing with Catalina Island off of the LA coast. Um, that is an idea of functional contiguity. And in fact, in a lot of agencies, the city has little specks of, pop of area that are not contiguous to the city itself. And so where are you going to draw those? They're called islands in the census data set. So if you have little islands of population that are in the city, but there's unincorporated populations between the city boundary and that next little pocket of, of city population, then you want to draw it to the city in the area that is maybe the transportation corridor or some other way to determine where it's functionally contiguous to the whole unit. The other way to think about functionally contiguous is that sometimes two things are, are literally contiguous, at least from like a satellite photo, but they aren't in practice. So let's say that Jonathan and I live in two homes and we're so close to each other that we could probably throw a Frisbee from each other's backyards to the other person. However, between us is a freeway. And to get from my house to Jonathan's house, I have to drive out of my house, down a busy road, uh, maybe a mile to a freeway underpass, go under the freeway, come back the other way, 
go through another district and then drive back over to get to Jonathan's house to go retrieve my Frisbee. We would be functionally, we would be literally contiguous from a satellite photo, but we wouldn't be functionally contiguous in the way that we would be represented as a community of interest or the way that we would kind of see ourselves in, in action. So we need to think about contiguous as being more than just, hey, Paul, that looks like a whole circle, so it's all contiguous. It might mean other things. Maintaining communities of interest is really one of the most important parts of the redistricting process. And it can include those protected classes that we talk about in the Federal Voting Rights Act. It can include you know, language minorities, religious minorities, and those other groups. But then there are other communities of interest that also have a claim to be drawn in a district in a way that can maximize their voting power. One key one would be the LGBTQ community. If you think about the LGBTQ community, not only can they have a shared community of interest, they also can be subject to state, federal, local laws in a way that's different than the rest of the residents of the city would be dealt with. Um, sometimes they can be in political campaigns, uh, you know, attacked based on their sexual orientation, or that can become an issue in political campaigns. We've seen in California, uh, as recently as 12 years ago, a uh, state ballot measure that infringed on their civil rights uh, being passed by the voters. So, you know, this community has a lot of need for protections that are very similar to the si same underlying preconditions that we find in the Federal Voting Rights Act, although they're not included in the Federal Voting Rights Act, they are a community of interest that has a need to be protected. Other communities of interest could be things like senior se seniors uh, who might live more densely in a part of a city and really need different services from the city government. Uh, students, downtown areas, suburban areas, rural areas versus um, you know, urban areas, and even things like socioeconomic status, renters versus homeowners. And what's important is in these communities of interest are three parts. One is you wanna identify communities or have communities come forward that can identify their shared culture, their characteristics. So uh, as an example, um, my mom's left-handed and her community of interest is uh, that she can't find the scissors that are the left-handed scissors and the can opener. And there's something about armrests or something like that that left-handed people have to deal with. And it's a group with a shared characteristic, but it doesn't meet the other criteria because you also want to have a community of interest have a geographic nature, something that you can apply to the districting process to identify them on a map. And they also should have a relationship back to the agency being districted. And this is a really unique one. A community of interest is not a community of interest is a community of interest. A community of interest for a city council redistricting could include something that maybe isn't a community of interest for a water district redistricting. Um, I'll give an example is that when we do water district redistrictings, we see issues around things like people's elevation. Maybe they have different water rates based on their elevation. Um, we see issues with mapping where the almond growers and walnut growers are. These are actual literal examples of things we've done in redistricting. But that's not something that's going to be important for a school board redistricting. And uh, what's important for school board redistricting, maybe the attendance patterns of students, might not be important for a county supervisorial redistricting. So we want to hear from people about their community of interest. We want to know where it exists and how to identify it on a map. And we want to know how it relates to the functions of government for the agency that we're doing the redistricting in. Following existing neighborhoods is in a way simply the, uh, another kind of community of interest. You might say to somebody, what's your community of interest? And it's like, oh, I'm, I live in Spar Heights and that's my community of interest. Uh, and the Fair Maps Act actually identifies neighborhoods as one of the key communities of interest that needs to be preserved in a districting process. And so we'll do a process 
through this redistricting to work to identify uh, what the communities of interest are or what the neighborhoods are in the city of San Jose and then uh, draw those neighborhoods down to the census geographies in a way for us to be able to come up with calculations for your redistricting to say how many neighborhoods are being preserved or not through the process. Keeping districts compact is another criteria. And again, it's one of those things that sounds easy to begin with, but then you get into kind of how it really is applied. If you were to Google compactness redistricting, you would find a ton of uh, academic articles on a bajillion different ways to calculate uh, what is compact. It's one of these things where uh, redistricting really kind of slams into kind of the math world. And there are calculations as an example where you take this not compact shape down there and you measure out the distance of the entire area and compare it to a circle that would be that same circumference. And the relationship between that and a perfectly spherical uh, area is a ratio that can become a nationally one of the most popular ways to measure compactness. There are other states and localities that use things like literally measuring how many kinks there are in this shape. I haven't counted it out in this shape, but it's probably 10 or something versus another version of a district maybe you could draw that only has three or four. Um, and then there's one state that we've actually done a little bit of work in where it literally says in their state law that you can't draw districts that have quote unquote funny shapes, which is kind of obviously in the eye of the beholder. Now, odd shapes aren't necessarily bad in a redistricting, particularly when cities oftentimes have odd shapes. So if you're to draw a district in an area where the city has, you know, a long strip and a, a, you know, like kind of a bulbous shape and then goes to another V-shaped thing, it has some weird shape, your district is naturally going to have a weird shape when you draw there. So it's not an indictment of the districting for it to have weird shapes. But in that, in the same time to draw districts as compact as possible is one of the criteria. Now in California, we've given up on a lot of these types of measurements and we've gone to one that is a little, I really like it. It's an elegant definition, but it takes a moment to really understand and digest. And so I'm gonna give some examples here. So the state law says that a district is compact uh, and you can prove compactness, but it has to do so, it, it cannot bypass nearby populations in favor of more distant populations. And so it takes a second to kind of read that and think about it, but let me show you the examples of how they work in reality. So this is one of the districts that actually was on the minds of lawmakers when they drew up this definition. And in this area, you have this red district. This is actually a district in the city council. And you have this population A in the southeastern corner. And if I was just looking at this area, and I know this area, uh, B and C are kind of like the nearby populations. And so normally you would want to draw those districts with other nearby populations and not bypass those nearby populations to go to a distant population. But that's exactly what they did in this redistricting. In this redistricting, they went to these two populations and essentially figured out a way to get from A to D and in doing so, they actually went through this little underpass on the 80 that's an under, unpopulated underpass. Um, I've actually ridden my bike out there and there's literally nothing there but like construction vehicles right now. And they connected it across a country club. So there's no people in the country club that is just to the right of the D and it joined it to a neighborhood far away. So this was what under state law now would be considered a non-compact district, we would call this a gerrymander. And in fact, it was done in a circumstance where they were converting to districted elections and the mayor happened to be living in that area of D. So we might not never get the redistricting contract for that city, but we like to call that one out. Another example is uh, nearby you. Um, this is actually Martinez. So uh, this, if you were to Google, Google Martinez redistricting, you'll see these maps because it was pretty outrageous. 
And in this instance, they made districts that were these long, sinuous districts, um, breaking up populations, splitting census blocks in order to ensure that each of the incumbents that were in that circle had uh, seats to, to run in in the future. But by in doing this, they essentially connected one population area with another far away population area, bypassing a ton of other nearby populations. So this again was a district that was brought up in legislative hearings as they determined the new criteria for compactness. This actually was called a parody of a gerrymander by a, by a judge. Now, I said earlier that funny shapes aren't necessarily bad. Um, and sometimes it takes a little looking at a districting plan to determine whether or not they actually were or were not following the totality of these requirements. And so in this example, I like to bring up one, which is actually a redistricting that we did. And I want to look at, in, in part, this one district down here at the bottom, district number five. Some people might look at that and say, well, Paul, looks to us like A and B are the nearby populations, and this district's drawn all the way out to join it to C. How or why does this district make sense? It's not as compact in those measurement things. It wouldn't be seen as as compact. And so why does it look like that? The reality is that A and C in this example are both part of a neighborhood known roughly as South Davis. And if you're to look at the map closely, there are only two places where you can cross from one end of Davis to the other. If you're familiar with this, driving out the 80, you'll go by past the Richards exit, and then you go past the Mace Boulevard exit. And in this instance, in between those two is the Capitol Corridor train. There's a railroad track that you cannot pass except on a little footbridge. And so in a way, this is like that example I gave earlier with Jonathan and I living close to each other in a satellite photo, but not actually contiguous to each other in reality. Um, to get from one end of, from the middle of five to the middle of four requires you to go all the way to one extreme side of the district or the other. So when we think about these things, we need to think about these things, not just as individual criteria, but how they work with each other and try to balance them. So in addition to those traditional redistricting criteria will follow, your city charter says that you will give consideration to these factors. And a lot of them are expressing of things that are already within the traditional criteria. So natural boundaries, street lines, which is uh, one that isn't necessarily um, you know, uh, in the traditional criteria, but still a useful way of drawing districts, and city boundaries, geography, um, oftentimes you'll see topography and geography being kind of used synonymously there. So that might mean, you know, more uh, uh, hillier areas or more flatland areas or lakes and rivers and things like that. Cohesiveness, contiguity, integrity and compactness of territory. And then finally, the communities of interest, which we've discussed. The Fair Maps Act adds additional criteria on top of those uh, traditional elements that I already mentioned. So inclusive of the traditional criteria, they say that you cannot consider the residence of individual people, inclusive of incumbents or candidates. So when we're talking about redistricting, you're not going to be wanting to uh, you know, have a discussion about, well, what will this district do to somebody I know wants to run for office, or what will this district do to somebody who is a uh, sitting incumbent? Um, they can't draw districts to advantage or disadvantage political parties. So again, uh, not something we really see in a lot of municipal redistricting, or almost at all, but it is something that can't enter the conversation as we're drawing districts to say, well, you know, that district's not going to be as, you know, supportive of one political party or another. Um, the state law also requires, in terms of process, requires you to have a certain set of number of hearings and also to encourage public engagement. Um, that not only means by facilitating meetings that are open and publicly available, but also working with local CBOs and the media 
to make sure that there's an understanding of what's happening. Also places requirements on the city to manage a website with all the information to be posted. And that website, uh, this when I first saw this, it kind of blew my mind. The website that manages that redistricting that has to have all the agendas posted to it, all the presentations like this one, um, all materials, all hearings, minutes, everything, that website has to be up and active for 10 years after the redistricting process. So it creates a permanent repository for all of this information. So moving on, census data. We can't do any of this until we get the census data. But as we know, we'll talk about it, the census data has been delayed, but it's important to talk about the different elements of the census data. So census files come in two types. There's geography, the actual blocks, block groups, census tracts. And there's also the data. That's the counts of population and the demographics. And the data conveys two types of information. It conveys point in time information. That's your decennial census data. That point in time data will tell us how big a district should be based on equal population, based on where everybody was residing on April 1st, 2020. The second type of data is statistical averages, estimated data. Um, and that would be most commonly the American Community Survey that gives us average data to determine number of different factors about the, the composition of the population above and beyond the, the very basic total population you find in the decennial census. For the tiger, for the, the geography, it's called the tiger files. Uh, the tiger, tiger is an acronym, um, but uh, I like putting this little graphic because the backstory is that the LA Times did a uh, Public Records Act request. And in the Public Records Act request, they found some bill from a graphic designer who had created a logo that they never used for the Tiger file. So um, the LA Times website sells little t-shirts uh, you can buy with one of these uh, graphics on it. But the, the Tiger files are these uh, physical geographies and they're nested units. They're census block, block groups, and tracks. And Oftentimes cities will also have their own geographies that they use, uh, generally parcel layers. Um, and sometimes those parcel layers align to census geographies, sometimes not. But we'll have to, after this redistricting is over, we use the census geographies as the, the way that we calculate our data. And at the end of the process, we work with the counties to move that information into precincts and they use parcel layers. So there are different geographies that will come up very, very late in the process. When we think about these, it's important to give kind of a visual example of, of how these census blocks, block groups and tracks look um, as we'll be seeing a lot of these and possibly moving in between these different geographies as we do our work. Looking at an area, I, this is just some random area in the state that looked interesting on a map, um, but we have, as an example here, all these little census blocks. It's actually, it's in Long Beach. Um, these tiny little census blocks have, some of them have zero population, some have 15 or 50 or 176 and so on, but they're small areas. And in more urban areas, you can see there are more squares and rectangles, but where they meet like a, a, a waterway or some other freeway, they start to have kind of weirder shapes overlapping the census blocks are census block groups. That's groups of census blocks that are clumped together. And when we talk about the American Community Survey, this is the, the geography in which a lot of that data comes is at the census block group level. And then thirdly, we have these tracts. Census tracts are pretty big um, and they encompass multiple census block groups. So they're perfectly nested geographies for us to do our work in. Now, I talked about the data products. Um, the primary data product used in redistricting comes from what's called the PL94171 decennial redistricting file. This is the census block geography and the total population counts. And it is required to be released as of two weeks ago. Um, but that data is not going to be released until September 30th, uh, based on the current census timeline. 
Um, however, they are going to release some data in a legacy format that might allow us to utilize the data a little bit earlier. When the census releases the data, either in the legacy format or the PL file, we aren't able to use it immediately. Uh, state law requires that we wait for uh, the reallocation of prison populations uh, before we actually start doing our redistricting. Um, the reason for this is that there's a kind of gerrymandering inherent in how populations of prisons actually count towards the total populations in say a Central Valley district that has a prison and that those populations don't count towards the populations where those people were originally living or where their actual residence is when they're not incarcerated. So the state has decided to undergo a process of taking what will probably end up being about 115,000 people from the state, uh, from state facilities and taking that population out of the census blocks where those facilities are located and redistributing, redistributing the populations to where those individuals lived when they were, when they were arrested or before they were incarcerated. Um, I don't believe that there is a state facility in the city, although somebody could correct me, maybe there is, but the more likely effect of this is that you're going to have some redistribution of population into portions of the city representing where those populations that are currently incarcerated lived prior to being arrested. This will probably have a very small, small impact on your redistricting, but it is something that's a required process before we can actually get the data. The American Community Survey is the other data piece that we hear about. And like I said, this is the data that often comes in the census block group layer. It's estimated data. The data we're gonna be using is actually a five-year estimated data from surveys conducted between 2015 and 2019. And those surveys included tons of questions about, you know, what kind of workforce are you in? What was your education level? What's your commute time? But most important to the redistricting process, they ask questions about ethnicity and citizenship that allow us to identify what's called the citizen voting age population. CVAP is the way it'll commonly be termed. The CVAP population, you can think about that as essentially like a eligible voter population. It's not perfectly the eligible voter population, but it's something akin to it. And it allows us to say, when we put on a map, this district is 39% Latino, this district is 33% Asian. Um, it's a calculation that's required by the Federal Department of Justice for the census to produce, and it will be a part of the districting process. This data we actually have. So um, uh, we can start to look at some of this data already to get a sense of those ethnic populations. Other data can be also incorporated in the districting process. Um, a couple that I think are, are most commonly seen and will be pretty active in this redistricting cycle will be that LGBTQ population that I mentioned earlier um, in full disclosure, this is one of the, the groups that we've worked with for the last 10 plus years on helping identify some of these populations and working with the State Redistricting Commission, but they're able to help agencies and the state identify where their populations are for the purposes of defining those communities of interest. Uh, environmental groups are another area where we're seeing a lot more activity around identifying actual data of people who are impacted by higher asthma rates or pollution or uh, noise or other factors, other environmental factors that can be put into census geographies and used as a uh, data point as a community of interest. Public input is essentially what takes a lot of the data and gives it life, um, saying, here's a geographic shape and here's a bunch of numbers from the census um, is valuable. But what is really valuable is when the communities can come forward and express what those other elements are that make them uh, cohesive, what makes them a community, where they interact with government and all those other factors that are important to determining how you're gonna draw district lines to preserve those communities of interest. 
Now, community of interest testimony is something that we should be receiving the entirety of this redistricting process. From now until the release of the data, we consider that essentially the pre-data phase of the redistricting. And in that phase, we can get information from the public about where their community of interest is and how it needs to be preserved in the districting process. After the data has been released, there's actually going to be a 21 day period in which we cannot draw draft plans. We have to essentially sit on our hands. We can have the data. We can look at how the data looks in the existing lines. We can have that data put into the public mapping tool so members of the public can map and draw lines, but we are prohibited in this 21 day waiting period uh, from actually drawing draft plans. We wanna essentially give the public a little bit of a head start on the process. It does seem a little bit crazy that we know our redistricting process is gonna be really compressed into the fall because of the late data, and we still have to wait this additional three weeks if the data comes out so late that we're within 60 days of our deadline, that window will shorten to seven days. If we're within 30 days of our deadline, that time period will shorten to seven days. But at some level, we will need to make sure that the public has access to that data and an ability to start to give that more informed input with the total population numbers, uh, even before we get to draw draft plans. Now, after we are able to draw draft plans, then that's another opportunity for public input. That public input, as we'll learn, really changes gears uh, when we actually have draft lines. Oftentimes, you won't see as much kind of abstract discussion about communities of interest, and you'll see more discussion of, you know, why did you draw the line down this road? Uh, why didn't you draw these two portions of the community together? Um, and a lot more discussion about lines. Um, it's just a different type of engagement that we'll see more commonly in those later periods when we actually have draft maps. So the input hearing process will include um, hearings like this, where the community will come forward, like a member of the community came forward at the beginning of this meeting, to give input, to have a way to communicate to the commission what they desire in the process of our redistricting, uh, redistricting and in the actual communities or the actual lines. Another way that we can get community of interest uh, testimony is through written forms, uh, forms that people can fill out uh, you know, in the public from drawing down a PDF from a website or from filling out a form on a website. Uh, these are ways to get those ans answers to those questions of, who are you? What is your community? Where is it geographically located? And how does it interact with the city in a way that makes it a community of interest for our process? There's also mapping, online mapping tools, uh, like a mapping tool that the city itself can develop, or online mapping tools that are already publicly available tools, uh, like the Statewide Redistricting Commission has their own mapping tool. There's other public mapping tools that people can use. We need to probably be considering ourselves kind of technology agnostic. If we develop a tool for people to draw lines, that's great. We wanna take in that information. If people wanna go off and create their own mapping tool like some organizations have done, great. They can send us data and we can make sure that that's available to the commission in a way that gives all maps equal, uh, you know, puts them all on equal footing. If they want to use some of these other organizations, groups, uh, or groups, uh, websites to draw maps, that's wonderful. Uh, we can draw in data as, as long as it's in a common format, and we can produce those maps for the commission to make sure that every map that's submitted has the equal opportunity to be understood and be uh, complete and helpful public testimony. Now, finally, and sometimes people want this to be the first question, uh, how are we going to draw lines? So we're not here to tell you how to draw lines, um, but I'm going to tell you some examples of ways that uh, agencies just as yourself or commissions have traditionally drawn lines. These are the three primary ways that lines are drawn in a commission process or in, in a current redistricting under the current kind of norms that we have. 
in the old days, if you were to look at a redistricting from 10, 20, 30 years ago, most redistricting started with, here's our existing districts, let's try to adjust them as little as possible in order to preserve and keep everything together as they normally have been. And that might still happen in parts of the state. But in most public, re public facing, open, transparent redistricting processes, we see these three methods being most commonly used. The first is starting with a publicly drawn map. When we most recently did redistricting in Napa and Davis, both of their redistrictings, uh, the final plan came from a map that was drawn by members of the public. Um, a second way to do it is to have staff draw maps. It's very common in these redistrictings. In fact, in Napa and, and Davis and in Santa Ana and other recent redistrictings we've done, we've been asked to supplement what, this, what the public has done by drawing maps based on criteria that the council or a commission gives us. They say, can you draw a draft plan that preserves these communities? Can you draw a different version of the plan that follows the city big streets and freeways um, and gives us criteria and the staff can draw plans uh, for you to review. And the third is to do a live line drawing. We don't commonly see agencies do a live line drawing like from scratch, but maybe live line drawing is a tool that's used once we're narrowing down plans or looking at trade-offs between different plans to say, plan B we really like, but what happens if we move uh, this line from this street to another street? And then doing a live process to look at those trade-offs. Um, these, uh, these different methods can be used in concert with each other, um, but we also see some agencies that essentially get into a pattern of essentially doing a hands-off redistricting in a way. It's not necessarily something I, I always recommend, but it's one way that some agencies have gone, which is really relying on the public to uh, draw maps. And they view their job not as going back home and drawing their own maps and then coming back to another meeting, but instead trying to look at and weigh different options that have been presented by the public. Um, one thing I would suggest is that members of the commission don't go and start drawing their own lines, especially before we get into that uh, draft map window where we're able to draw lines after the final data has been produced. Um, one reason for this just has to do with human nature. Um, I like to use the example of loading the dishwasher. Um, when I move into our house, you know, the first couple of times I loaded the dishwasher, I started putting the big plates in one section, the little plates in another, the big bowls in another, or the little bowls in another. And I kind of started creating a little structure. And I swear, every time I do the, the dishes from then on, I always put the dishes in the same way. Just in my brain, it's kind of like how they fit. Some other person could come and very rationally come up with a totally different way of doing it. Um, but I'm rather stuck by the way that I've seen it, done it, and that practice of doing it and physically being involved in it has, has kind of precluded my ability to see other things as much now that I've done this loading the dishwasher in the same way a few times. The map drawing process can be the same. Uh, you could go out now, today, go onto a website, one of these public websites, start drawing maps of the city, and you might fall in love with a certain construction of districts in a way that precludes you from being as open-minded when the public's giving you testimony or when you're uh, actually in the drawing process. So it's in a way good to have a, um, a more open mind and not get into that trap of having your own preconceived ideas about district processing on, based on estimated data or, or um, you know, having that done before we actually have a chance for the full process to carry itself out. The community input on this is really what's important. Um, and as I said earlier, you'll see a change as we get into post draft map process where you're gonna get community input that's very focused on uh, the specifics about particular lines and less about communities of interest. Um, but it's still very, very valuable part of the process. And one of the things in the state law is that when we do draft maps, they need to be public for seven days before we actually have discussions about them. Gone are the days when somebody walks into a meeting and says, oh, my cousin drew this map 
uh, I want to pass this map. Um, that's not how it works anymore. We want to have graph maps be up on the website for a week so the public can see them to develop their own testimony, maybe send an email into the commission, prepare to testify and not just be surprised by some map that somebody shows up with at an upcoming hearing. So really the transparency is reinforced by a requirement that these maps are public for seven days before we consider them. Now, right now, you'll have your own deadlines. We'll have our own scope of or our own work plan that we'll develop about when things have to be done. But it's important to note that the agency has to complete their redistricting process by December 15th under the Fair Maps Act. This is a deadline that is set by the legislature, but it might change. So we need to be understanding that things might have to be flexible. Um, we can proceed under the assumption that this deadline won't change, um, but there's possibility that the legislature or courts will step in at some point because of the late census data and essentially you know, maybe give the commission a week or two or three extra weeks in order to complete the full process. We'll be updating you as that happens so that you know the latest as to what those timelines are looking like. Um, but as we develop our own kind of work plan and hearing schedule, we'll have to understand that unlike past redistricting cycles when everything, every deadline was met and every time frame seemed very rigid, in this environment, we're having to deal with a lot more unknowns and potential flexibility uh, having to be built into the process. And with that, I will stop my sharing and I hope that I'll see some raised hands and some questions. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul. Are there any commissioner questions? You can raise your hand, that would be great. If not, I will start with a couple of questions. Um, Obviously, for the time being, we are in a period where we can gather uh, feedback. Oh, I see a couple of uh, hands up. Um, feedback about communities of interest. Uh, would love your thoughts about that, Paul. What that might entail, what it might look like, um, how much time that might take, all, all of that. Are you saying the community input part of the of the? Yeah, well, like asking the community, how do they define their community of interest? Um, mm -hmm. What do they define as their neighborhood? Uh, exactly. Those types of things. So what I really would, and we're doing this in other agencies, what I really encourage is that we have a process where we start to set up hearings that are designed for the community to engage. Those input hearings should probably start with one of you as the commissioners giving a little bit of my presentation We'll pull out some of these elements in my presentation to explain you know, what a community of interest is, to really kind of pull out of the people who are giving their input, not just tell us where you live, which is maybe a part of it, but tell us where you live, how that looks on a map, and then how it relates to the agency and its governance. Because we really want to get all three of those elements. And there's essentially two reasons why we need this. Going into the redistricting and devising lines you're gonna to wanna to know what communities of interest are really being protected in different parts of the city and understand those trade-offs. It's a key part of understanding how you're going to enact your redistricting plan. And also, as we finalize our districting plan, we'll be looking backwards too. We'll say, okay, this is the district that the, agent, that the commission has voted on. How are we gonna tell the council, how are we gonna tell the public what district four is? Well, we'll define it by its communities of interest and we'll point back to testimony that was given by different members of the, of the public in order to kind of reinforce the, the essentially the, the, what are the goals of this geographic space you've created and now called District 4. So it's really important both in its looking forward and looking back elements that we'll have in the districting process. Great, thank you. BJ. There we go. Um, so I wrote down my question. Back to when you were talking about the Section 2 determination to defer to legal counsel, um, does that mean that a particular um, district or section has already been determined to fall under Section 2? Or legal counsel can say, well, I think we can get them determined as uh, under Section 2? Yeah, so first, what the what the Legal counsel will look at is, a, is whether or not certain populations in the, dis, in the city 
can meet those criteria. Is there a population in the city that votes cohesively? Meaning that racially polarized voting analysis has been done either by the, by the city or their attorneys, or even maybe by an outside group like a MALDEF or Asians, Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Some racially polarized voting analysis has been done that shows, hey, this population, not looking at the existing lines or not looking at future lines, just this population in this part of the city qualifies under that first metric. They vote cohesively. Then they'll look at, okay, if we have this population that votes cohesively, they'll ask somebody who does essentially what I do. They'll say, hey, with that, you're not actually drawing the district lines, but you're just a, a consultant outside of the process. If you were drawing lines, can you actually draw an area where that population that's cohesive is 50% or more of a district? And that consultant will be able to tell them, yes, I can draw one or two or three districts where that population is cohesive and it is the majority of a district. They'll actually potentially ask a follow-up question to that, which is, yes, you've defined that this group kind of has block voting. You've defined that you can draw an area where there are more than 50% of the population. Can you look at past election results and essentially uh, simulate elections within that area to say that that group will have the ability to elect their candidates of choice in a district that is comprised of 50 or 51 or 52 or 53% of their population. And with all that information, your legal counsel, probably without exposing all of that analysis and all those potential lines and all that data, but your legal counsel will come forward and they'll be able to say yes, as we've looked at it or no, depending on what their answer is. Um, there is a need for the commission to consider this population as a section two protected group and there is a requirement that in the districting process that there be a district in this general area where that population is 50% or more of its uh, total citizen voting age population. So it's a process. Um, and once a section two determination has been made, then and only then can you start talking about, okay, how are we gonna draw this district to make sure that the Latino or Asian or other community has the ability to elect a candidate of choice in this area. It essentially opens up the doors for you to talk about the racial composition of a district, where in another part of the city, you won't be able to because you won't have your attorney signing off on that section two requirement. I see our uh, city attorney representative uh, on video. That's now. great. I didn't know the Did city you... attorney was here. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> have I uh, have I aired anywhere, city attorney? I, de I generally punt to the city attorney on all these questions. Uh, no, I mean, that's it, it is something that we would want to look at um, to determine, um, you know, I don't, I don't believe in the past under prior redistricting, we ever had a section two uh, district. Um, I'd have to do some research on that. But yes, any any type of question we would look into and, and we really can only do that until the data has been uh, uh, produced. Perfect. Thank you. And Adina. Yes, Paul, thank you very much for, for that thorough presentation. I feel like it's um, something that we're probably going to use and refer back to as we um, move forward with this. Um, so I think that my question is a variation of Teresa's question. And I'm, I, I'm hoping that you might be able to provide a little bit of more clarity to the, the term community of interest. For me, I guess what I'm struggling with is whether it's enough for a community group to, to have certain similar characteristics or is the definition a little bit more specific? One thing that I heard from you today was um, almost like it's a group that might need to be protected, that they, there's some interests that we are trying to protect. Yeah. Yeah. So like I was saying in the presentation that you want to think about these three different criteria. A community of interest is first off something that has a shared, uh, you know, uh, kind of some kind of shared makeup. As an example, all of us, we ingest oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. So that you could say that's our community of interest. However, there is no geographic representation of that. Everybody does that. 
So it's not really for the purposes of redistricting an effective community of interest. Um, Can I interrupt however, you for a moment, Paul, and ask everyone to uh, be on mute? I, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Thank you so much. Um, so it isn't an effective community of interest because it can't be geographically represented. So you say, okay, dog parks. People who take their dogs to dog parks, that is something that is a shared interest, a shared common relationship between people. And I can map where the dog parks are and where people go to dog parks. But let's say as an example, and I don't know if this is true, but let's say the city doesn't manage dog parks, but the county does. So you'd say, okay, you check the box number one, you have a shared relationship. You check the box number two, we can map you. But you didn't check the box number three because there's nothing about going to dog parks that relates back to the work of the city council that makes you a really important community of interest for drawing city council lines. Because you're not gonna be able to have a more effective voice in your city government regarding dog parks if dog parks aren't in the jurisdiction of the city council. So a, you wanna look at things that kind of check all three of those boxes. So maybe the city, let's say runs a number of local uh, senior citizen centers. And you have an area of the city that has a density of seniors and those seniors come forward and say, I'm part of a senior community. We are, uh, have a shared common uh, relationship we have a geographic area where we're more dense and we have this need to make sure that our rights are protected because we are constantly needing to get the services that is part of what the city provides to us. So you wanna try to, as people are testifying, you're not gonna tell somebody, you know, you know, we're not accepting your community of interest. Anybody can come forward, anybody can add themselves to the Zoom and say, my community of interest is left-handed people and you say, thank you. But when we actually get into the actual redistricting, we're going to try to identify those communities of interest that really are the most operative for the work we have to do and work to try to, if they can be identified and placed in a district, to make sure that they're in a district, not split into five districts that they don't have to be. So there's a little bit of art form to this, as you can understand. And it really does mean that we want aggressive and you know, complete uh, testimony from the public in order to try to identify all these communities of interest, especially since oftentimes the communities of interest that are most readily available are the ones that are maybe more affluent and more tech savvy or more engaged. And we really need to try to do the work to identify those communities of interest that either um, are less uh, engaged in the process um, or even in some of the examples we've seen uh, reticent to step up and identify their community of interest. Um, one of the people on our staff who's listening right now is Sophia Garcia, who will be working with the city on their outreach uh, plan. And Sophia was at the Dolores Huerta Foundation when we first met her. She was representing groups of farm workers and, and other community members in Kern County who were honestly afraid to come forward to a big redistricting meeting and speak before 50 or 100 people to identify their community of interest. So they worked uh, with the agencies in the area to help identify those communities, come forward and identify those communities of interest. And so we'll be working to try to get that community of interest testimony, not just from the, the ones that are most readily available, but also making sure that we're going deep in the community to identify them. Thank you. And Jonathan? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Paul, for for your uh, for your presentation. Um, when you were talking about the uh, compactness and the policy and the laws kind of surrounding that, it kind of came to me as if that that's going to be a more key issue uh, above many of the other criteria, unless you, we go to like a, the uh, the section two exactly. Uh, uh, thing uh how do y'all move like on a sliding scale almost the criteria of you know we want to have this be compact but we also have maybe some other uh community of interest that may not have been designated as section two yet but we don't want to completely forget about yeah so you want to think about these these are rank criteria from the state equal population, compact, communities of interest, and we go down the list. But it's also 
that one doesn't necessarily dominate all the others. You don't say, well, this is more compact than this, so we're going to split this community of interest just in the name of compactness. What we'll likely need to do is balance a lot of these criteria. And I often like to think about it as kind of check boxes. We want to look at a plan and look at those, those districts and say, OK, those districts, they look compact enough. Check. We want to make sure that they're equal population, so within that 10% range or whatever is determined. Check. It's, it's equal and it's compact. Then we want to look at how are we preserving communities of interest. You might end up with a plan that has districts that are less compact than another proposed plan, but you're doing it in order to preserve more communities of interest, even some communities of interest that aren't those section two communities of interest. So you don't want to be in a situation where you, you say, well, well, the demographer said they need to be equal. So I'm just going to pick the redistricting plan that's the most equal. That's not going to be equitable, right? We want to have a process that takes all these different criteria and tries to balance them as you decide among potentially many different competing redistricting plans. And it is, there are trade-offs. We might have a situation in a hearing where you have some members of the commission that favor one plan because they think that it's more compact, it preserves more neighborhoods, and another person prefer, or another set of people preferring another plan that's less compact maybe splits one or two neighborhoods, but really keeps a key community of interest more whole in one district. And if you said to me, which plan is better, I'd probably say they both meet all the criteria and it's up to you to determine some of those trade-offs. All right, thank you. And thank you for being part of my earlier example. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't ask your permission first. Someone's got to do it, it might as well be me. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I have a couple of other questions for you, Paul. Are you, you're involved with the California State Redistricting Commission, is that right? Um, yeah, I've been, I'm not actually on staff with the State Redistricting Commission or anything like that, but um, you know, yesterday I was part of a, a lengthy uh, hearing they had talking about how the state's gonna do community of interest testimony. Um, I'll be on a panel later this month with the Quality California talking about the identification of LGBTQ communities around the state. So. I'm engaged, but I don't, I don't work for them. Great. So not thinking about San Jose in particular, I'm not asking you about our city. Is there a sense that, and I know every jurisdiction will be different, but we can expect big changes um, this time around. And the reason I say that is I don't know what happened in the last redistricting, but just, I guess, compare 2011 to 2021, if you would. Sure. Um, so first off, uh, operationally, it's going to be the same process as last time now with the statewide redistricting commission using it, doing its second run here. Um, so some things will be the same, particularly in process. Some things are very different already in terms of their process because of the late census data, but the idea of the hearings being open, transparent, the criteria they're using, a lot of that stuff's the same. One big change that I think well, there's a couple of changes that are gonna impact the redistricting process. Total population is gonna obviously impact the redistricting process. Maybe even how many congressional districts we have will be determined by the census, we believe by April 30th, but maybe as soon as April 27th. Um, the ethnic composition of the populations around the state. Uh, a real quick way of putting it is that the Latino population has grown almost everywhere in the state the API, the Asian community population has grown most, uh, has grown the most in the most heavily dense uh, API communities. So uh, places in, in your county and in San Gabriel Valley, we see extraordinary in parts of Orange County, we see really high rates of growth of the Asian community in areas that are already heavily Asian. And then the African American community has dissipated again, just like it did in 2010, where you see more people from that African-American community and, and the black citizen voting age population kind of going out of traditional areas like Oakland and Richmond or down in uh, LA and more out to Elk Groves and Riverside or San Bernardino and other suburbs and exurbs. So the population changes will impact the redistricting, the ethnic composition of the state will impact the redistricting. And then one thing that's, very big in the statewide redistricting is the elimination of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act 
um, required pre-clearance of the redistricting before the lines could be implemented. And the way it worked is imagine we did all our work as this commission and somebody told you that when we're done, there's gonna be some federal uh, agency that has to sign off on our plans. And if they don't like our plans, they're gonna give it to the courts to redo all of our work. And that's what the decision was made by the State Redistricting Commission in 2011 was because section five was in place, they knew particularly in parts of the Central Valley that if the federal government didn't like their lines, that they would have all their work thrown out. So they did a very defensive job of redistricting in the Central Valley. And as a result, essentially redistricted the state Central Valley first, then Northern and Southern California. With section five gone, you're gonna see a lot different, a lot of changes in the statewide redistricting process and the ability to create uh, majority minority districts. And even the, the ability to create districts as an example in this part of the state where uh, Monterey being a section five county meant that if you were in Southern Santa Clara County and you needed more population, you couldn't go South. Merced and Monterey, in fact, both were under section five. Um, so it had impacts on the line drawing. So essentially the 2011 commission will have more freedom to draw lines than they did in, or the 2021 commission will have more freedom than the 2011 commission. That's Thank my non-city side uh, analysis of the state redistricting. Thanks. Chris, I'm sorry to, I'm oh, sorry yes. to interrupt, but I have to hop off to teach. Oh, I have a have class at 730. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, BJ. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Thank you, Paul. It was great. Lenka? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Paul, thank you for a very thorough presentation. I found it very informative. And something I wanted to probe a little bit with you was something that you had mentioned in regards to non-US citizens and not being part of our consideration with the equal population for the districts. And in San Jose, I believe in the last census, uh, non-US citizens represent about 20% of the population here. So just wanted to get a sense as to you know, how we consider that or not, you know, as we're looking at the district lines. So the non-citizen population is absolutely counted in the total population when you're drawing each individual district. So that equal representation piece, uh, all districts will be relatively equal based on total population, regardless of citizenship status. Now, when we talk about that other piece under the Federal Voting Rights Act, when you say, hey, Paul, what percentage Latino or Asian or African-American um, is that district? We'll have a separate data set we use for that. That data set is essentially looking at the eligible voter population because we're talking about that uh, equitable share of voting power in each district. And so while there was a lot of debate about whether or not citizenship would be included in the US Census, um, the fact is that citizenship is included in that American Community Survey. Um, and so we do have data from the Department of Justice required, from the census required by the Department of Justice that allows us to look at that citizen voting age population over 18 and the ethnicity of those populations in order to determine how effective a district could be in electing candidates of choice. So that's where citizenship, non-citizenship is seen as part of the conversation, but not in the size of districts because we have all non-citizens and citizens on equal footing with regards to the size of districts. My question is, I think sort of related, Lenka. I, um, those populations, we have to trust that the census captured non-citizen populations in, in addition to citizen populations. And so my question is, are you starting to hear any uh, grumbling about the national census and the data that we're going to receive? I'm just worried that, you know, at, at the 10th or 11th hour, somebody will overturn the data that we received or there will be some kind of conflict over them. Any, any sense of that? Yeah. So um, in redistricting, unfortunately, uh, we're required to use the U.S. Census database that's provided to us, and we're not able to manipulate or change that, even if we know of areas that have had chronic underperformance in the census or low uh, completion rates or other information. 
Uh, this can be incredibly frustrating. One of the redistrictings I did was in the city of Santa Ana. And at the time we were doing it, um, we actually knew from research that there was a chronic undercount of, in particular, non-citizen kids because families were feeling compelled to complete the census, but they just wouldn't put their kids. I, I could understand why. Um, and there was also chronic undercounts of sometimes people putting in their household, maybe the two primary adults, but not putting a grandmother um, because maybe the grandmother isn't a citizen. So they just wouldn't put that. Why would you want to potentially in a, in a country where you feel like your data is gonna be used uh, against you? Um, and there have been things in the culture that have increased this distrust, fears that um, the state's undocumented driver's license program data would be utilized by the federal government to do enforcement, fears that DACA data would be utilized to do enforcement. Um, in that environment, you can see why, you know, a third person comes to you you know, you gave your information to the DMV, you gave your information for DACA, and both of those you feel like your trust was violated, and now a third person's coming to you asking you for more information. So we're honestly expecting to have poor data around a lot of these non-citizen populations, but we're also um, unfortunately expecting that there won't be much of a vehicle for us to uh, try to resolve that in the districting process. Now, one thing agencies have looked at is, let's say um, we know that this part of the city has a lower performance in their completion rates of the census, or we believe that a part of the city has lower rates in, in terms of the census. You have that buffer of the deviation. And you could say, okay, we've got five different plans. In that one plan, that part of the city it's in a district that is 3% under, 4% under. That might be more equitable because in a district that's a little bit smaller, it's, it's in a way accounting a little bit for that undercount in the census. Um, this can sometimes come into, you might have somebody else who says, well, there's a new development over here, so we need to adjust for that new development. Or the student population had been gone uh, on the day that the census was conducted, so we need to account for that. Um, you know, imperfection in the census data. So at some point it becomes a little bit of a, a challenge to try to weigh, you know, all the myriad of possibilities as to how the census data could be wrong. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, we find ourselves just treating the census as the census and conducting the, the redistricting in the, the best way we can with the data we're given. Thank you. I do have one more question, but I'm going to hold off because I see that we have a couple members of the public that uh, would like to weigh in on this item. So I'm going to ask staff to facilitate uh, that involvement. Okay, the first speaker is Paul Soto. Uh, yes, my name is Paul Soto. I'm a, uh, I was born and raised in, in San Jose, in particular in the Horseshoe. And this is, this is a very critical moment because the redlining policies that actually wrote these lines historically have not been checked. The, the city or the county have not taken a formal position with respect to those redlined areas that concentrated populations, created voting blocks, created, uh, and, and what they did is they leveraged power from those positions. It determined where schools, it determined uh, uh, the quality of certain schools. I mean, the, the redlining must be critical. It, there must be a baseline by which you use those redlining policies and what the damage that it did, and then use that and institute that into these, uh, and factor that into these decisions. Um, the other one is that, is that the horseshoe itself is going to be that is going to be the most contested area because district six wants that now they want the horseshoe you see pre uh, prior back in the 70s 80s and 90s and even the 2000s uh willow glenn wanted absolutely nothing to do with that area and and we already know that because of the neglect uh in terms of uh, in terms of 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 resources in that particular neighborhood as related to roads as it related to a lot of other city services with respect to that area. I'm from that area, I was raised there. 
My father picked fruit in Salsipuedes in the 1940s. He grew up on a tent right on the property of Guadalupe Church. And so th this has to be a very, uh, uh, this has to be front and center in the way that it guides your decisions, because a lot of, of, of what has happened in the city has not been reckoned with or rectified. Thank you so much, Paul. Let's get the other public comment, and then I'd actually like to ask you, Paul, about redlining. The next speaker is ending 5140. You know, in, instead of redistricting, has anybody in this city, in this county, in this state, ever thought of just doing a good job for its residents and not having to jumble around? all these districts and everything. Have you ever just thought of like, you know, spending the money wisely, investing in proper infrastructure, but you guys are worried about, I mean, it gets really weird how you're worrying about certain demographics. This sounds like the, the Chicago democratic machine under mayor Daly, how you're trying to draw, draw these districts. It's really weird. I mean, it's really almost Orwellian. And, and uh, buildings on segregation, when you guys are uh, against segregation, you're really not because it's just, a, it's just a way to manipulate everybody, to get everybody against each other. It's, it's classic Marxism, what, what you people are doing. It's disgusting, really. I mean, just do a good job with the city. Make it so the police and fire can show up on time versus an hour later. Uh, make sure that the you know the toilets aren't overflowing at our public parks. The, make sure the fountain works at the Rose Garden. And you guys want to redraw districts? You can't even run this city correctly. This city is a joke. I mean, you're the downtown. It looks like Detroit. It looks like Detroit, like in 1982. I mean, it's uh, it's unbelievable. I I wonder when they're just going to hit the whole place with a bulldozer someday because there, there's no you know. No one, no one's living down there. No one's shopping down there. Uh, how are you able to run run a redistricting in, in in this city, state, or county? It's a disaster. Everybody there should be ashamed of themselves how how they try to run this. Thank you. The next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi. Thank you. Um, thank you for. Uh, allowing my public comment earlier on the consent calendar, uh, my mind uh, was in a different place. And I was thinking of the city charter process. And I thought this was, there was a special meeting of the city charter coming up this week. And I, I got my signals crossed. I'm very sorry about that. Um, this was an interesting item to listen to and learn about. And um, uh, I was a bit, taken aback by, I, I thought it was a really good lecture. I was taken a bit aback by uh, that since uh, the Supreme Court has, has, has taken away uh, a federal government power in, in having a say in, in certain uh, voting districts, uh, the present presenter, you know, made that sound like a good thing for states and that states now have a bit more freedom to work, at least California does. Uh, you know, in other states, that may be a serious issue and serious problem to contend with. And I was, I was very much uh, concerned and, and hopeful that the, with the, the, those voting, federal voting rights issues, that there would be a way to negotiate and, and, and make a more clean transition of power to eventually allow one's own state to uh, have control over uh, the redistricting ideas. And, you know, I guess, you know, both sides, there is both sides of the argument, and I don't want to get too much into that, but I'm, I'm much more interested in the negotiated process that, uh, and, and the transition of power from, say, a federal agency to a state agency, and uh, how that can work in the future. And, uh, so I thought I'd just make light of that this time. It's just, uh, I don't know, something to think about. And uh, what Thank you. That was the final public speaker. Thank you very much. Um, so Paul, I wanted to just, uh, a couple, just a couple of closing questions. 
you know, given that keeping districts compact and following existing neighborhoods are important principles for the redistricting process, do you want to talk about historic uh, redlining and, and what that has meant for neighborhoods? Yeah, I think um, first off, um, I, I hope that the members of the commission, when they listen to Paul speak, that they were able, just like I was, to kind of tick off those three things that we talked about and what defines a community of interest. I mean, that was really ideal testimony in that it talked about um, a shared community, shared experiences, family, history, um, something that defined a community and, and, and brought it together, right? Then talked about physical geography, described a neighborhood, described a physical area in the city. And then thirdly, tied it to something that has to do with the governance of the agency that you're doing the redistricting in. The history of redlining is um, obviously something that throughout the Bay Area, and I'm not as specific to the actual you know, areas in San Jose where it was most endemic, but that history of that redlining does provide us an opportunity to look at certain communities and how there was active disenfranchisement and disempowerment of communities that can be uh, used as a way of helping to define a community of interest even now. And another thing is that there are maps, um, I know throughout the state, that could be superimposed onto a map of the city in order to help define where in the city uh, those historic red line communities were and to see if there are ways that districting can be done where whoever gets elected to that district will have the needs of that community kind of foremost in their minds as they're, as they're working on behalf of the residents. Um, so that was ideal testimony. I thought it was great to have at the end of the presentation that I gave. Um, and we're happy to work with you on uh, helping integrate that kind of data to uh, the, the maps that you'll end up working on for the districting process. Thank you so much. Okay, last question, it's a softball. Um, are you hearing of any jurisdiction that are planning uh, in-person meetings in this age of COVID or is everything gonna be virtual? Um, San Bernardino County, um, I think they're doing in-person meetings. Um, might be a little bit having to do with culture of different communities and their willingness or desire to push for in-person versus virtual. Um, there are a couple things that come into play. Um, First off, you want to have access for the public, and uh, technology can be great at making it more possible for people to participate, um, you know, easily to call in, to get on video, to do it from home. And it does, particularly for certain segments of the population, allow greater and easier access to have their input heard by the commission. Um, when I say that, I say particular segments of the population, there might be other segments of the population for whom in-person interaction, in-person opportunities provide a greater opportunity to have input. So um, I think that through the course of this, dep depending on the realities of whatever the current health orders are at the time, we should consider meeting people where they are at some level uh, in order to ensure that we're not kind of disenfranchising anybody from participating in the process as a result of the, the method that we use. We wanna be kind of technology agnostic uh, in what we do. That being said, I also wanna point out that there is a potential of legislation that's being considered right now that would require all hearings to be hybrid, uh, ensuring that even when we do do local meetings that there'd be an opportunity for people to zoom in or participate in that way. And from a practical standpoint, um, I think that a lot of the work that we can do as consultants for you will be improved by being able to have some of our staff participating in a, uh, you know, in a virtual format. So we might, as an example, have some staff that can come to a community meeting, but when it's time for me to give uh, some input, I might be listening to the hearing remotely and being able to provide input in an environment like this and then still be able to you know, hop over at Berkeley Redistricting Commission is having their meeting at this exact same time. And if necessary, a half hour later, I can be in Berkeley, which honestly, I can't do that in real life, right? Fantastic. Uh, Commissioner Martinez, I see you have a question. 
I just wanted to clarify that the speaker talking about redlining spoke about horseshoe. I just wanted everyone to know that I believe he's talking about the Gardner neighborhood, Gardner Elementary School area. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. Really, really appreciate your uh, time and your expertise. Really uh, happy to have you on board, uh, helping us with this process. I'm really happy to be with you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so moving on to item seven, new business. We do not have any uh, old business agendas. We just talked, that should have been old business. We don't have any old business agendas. We uh, just talked about new business. And finally, item eight on the agenda is what we're calling open forum. This is a time for the public comments on items that are not on the agenda. The Brown Act prohibits the commission from discussing any items that is not agendized. So um, let's see if there are any speakers who would like to comment. In yes, session. we have three speakers with their hands up. Paul Soto is first. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, again, uh, Paul Soto, I have uh, I have 15 ancestors buried at Oak Hill Cemetery. They didn't have the opportunity to reap the benefits of this this cultural shift. This 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 uh, this very clear, very concise, very um, accurate articulation of what racism has done to populations in the city over the past 80 years. And what institutionalized racism and systemic racism looks like is right here in this particular uh, 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 endeavor in terms of the redistricting. There's literally billions of dollars that was deprived of Mexicans that is sitting in equity in Willow Glen and Rose Garden. They have never been checked on that. That was a deprivation of ancestral wealth that I was deprived of. And I was deprived of it in two ways. Due process of law and equal protection under the law. Those are two constitutionally protected rights that were stripped from the Mexicans as a result of redlining. That needs to be rectified. I, I, I can't put it any way clear. It must be rectified. And here in this, in this uh, forum, this is the means in place where that's done. I mean, if we're really going to talk about, if we're really going to be a city that is going to move in, in the direction of equity, it really is going to take people with courage. It's going to take people with 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 understanding and 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 a lot of research. I've been doing research for probably about maybe about 15 years. And so I'm I come to these meetings equipped. I come to these meetings prepared. And if there ever was a department that is going to be uh saddled with the responsibility of undoing institutionalized racism, it's thank you. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thank you for the meeting tonight. Um, I have a difficult uh, public comment tonight. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know how correct I may be about it, but I'm trying to bring this out in public comment and make light of it and, and, and for thought and consideration. I think a lot of people, uh, city government and the uh, everyday people, they've been working hard the past few weeks and months. Uh, we're starting to try to make clear to each other is there a very distinct possibility there may be an upcoming natural disaster in the SF Bay area, like a large earthquake. There's also, you know, the threat of wildfires and it's electrical outage and sea level rise that are gonna be really important issues uh, for San Jose and the Bay area in the next few years. And um, I, I don't know how you can consider that if it needs to be considered in your redistricting plans, but uh, I thought I would mention it. If it is applicable, you know, maybe it can help uh, as it should in your decision-making, however you need to work at this time in redistricting ideas. It's my personal hope that by say 2025 will be passed, uh, you know, uh, a natural disaster event and that we would really be 
going, you know, with all our best after 2025. And uh, I'm hopeful of what that can offer. But I feel we may be in for a tough few years coming up. And um, I, I just I just felt I should mention it. I don't know how correct I am, but just that so you can have choices how you can think and work at this time. I hope it can help. So uh, yeah, and hopefully I can learn more as time goes on, as I think we all are. I think there's been an interesting way in the Bay Area it's being talked about at this time. I hope I can add to that formally and not in an alarmist. Thank you. Caller ending with 5140. You know, I'd like to see what this city and county would look like if it didn't have all the wealth and all these supposed smart people and all these technology companies. Could you imagine what this place would be like if you people didn't have money? It, it would. I, I couldn't imagine. It's it's horrible now. The telecom is bad. You know, our internet's not very good. The utility companies are, and trash companies are raising up the rates with poor service, uh, dirty water, bad, dirty electrical power, natural gas pipelines that haven't been retrofitted for, you know, for probably half a century, maybe more. And I, I don't know. I mean, redistricting like that's going to make something better. You, you're crazy. You're, you, you're, you know, you want to redistrict. You want to do the urban villages. You want to do road dikes. You want to do all these things, but you, but this city cannot provide basic emergency services in a timely manner. You've got these public bat or the, the toilets at the at the Rose Garden overflowing. You can't even keep the fountain running at the Rose Garden. I want to know what you can do, which is really nothing. Potholes everywhere. The worst roads. It's like we have snow here or something. This city needs to get back to the basics and stop focusing on things that aren't that aren't bettering the community. Everything that this city ever talks about is doubling down on bad ideas. It's like a bunch of hippies trying to run a commune. And the city council, it should be a shame of themselves, the police department, all the powers that be in this city and county are terrible people. They don't do anything to better the community at all. I wish there were more people who would call in and voice their opinions. I think people are too afraid to do so. Thank you. Are there any more public comments? That was the last public speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, Ramon, I see your hand up or do you have a question still? No, you're good. Okay. Um, moving on to item nine is uh, the meeting schedule and agenda items. Uh, so uh, the next meeting will be on May 20th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. Um, hope to see you all then. And until then, we get a chance to adjourn now. Is there a motion to adjourn? Don't all raise your hands at once. Sure, sorry, sure. Teresa, well, let, I'll do we, that. Sorry, oh. before we go, I'm sorry. Yes. Would oh. it be possible? I wanted to see if maybe we could put on the agenda for next week a couple of items. Um, I'm curious to, to have a discussion about whether we are at a place to um, develop some sort of timeline to give us a framework with certain benchmarks for, for us to meet um, and, you know, so that we can uh, have our recommendations ready in time. And I don't know what the proper mechanism would be to like put that on, on um, for our agenda for next month, as well as maybe begin discussing community engagement. I'm still not clear on um, what our role will be and how much you know outreach we can do um, as a commission. And so um, those are yep. some things that have been on my mind. Thank you. Um, so yes, absolutely. We should, we'll talk about timeline next time and community engagement. So the idea was again, to have uh, our consultants on board. They're gonna help us design a community engagement strategy and program. And I think for the next meeting, um, we are, they are helping us to get a panel of individuals who have served on previous commissions. 
um, who can give us advice on, you know, the deliberations that they went through, all of this to prepare us to then start doing uh, the public input. But absolutely, I think um, talking about the timeline and starting to get a sense of community engagement is perfectly uh, right on track. Staff, do you have any thoughts, uh, city um, clerk? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I'm actually um, typing up notes to send to you, the chair, after this meeting. Um, we can definitely add timeline because we've already been working on a timeline with redistricting partners. So I can give you a general, we have a, an outline for the next three meetings. Um, and then I'm working with them on the, the timeline beyond that. And then um, the community engagement, the, the next piece, and then the, uh, what, I think it's the July meeting I'm asking for, is we're going to talk more about community engagement. So we'll, we'll touch on that next week. We're gonna talk more about community engagement uh, because our plan is to start doing the communities of interest hearings in the like August, September timeframe. So we definitely have time to talk about that. Thank you, Anadina. Okay, any other comments about the agenda uh, item nine or the schedule? We can, we can make sure we earmark a good chunk of time to talk about it next time in May. Okay, so we had a motion to adjourn by Jonathan. Do we have a second? Second. And Adina, thank you. Okay, well, we don't really need to do the roll call, but thank you all so much. Have a good evening.